What's happening, everyone? This episode of the podcast is sponsored by 101 CBD, the makers of premium, full-spectrum, raw CBD oil products. So all of their sublingual tinctures, the Alleviate that helps with pain and inflammation, the Chill that helps me get a better night's sleep, and the Boost, which just helps me, you know, just with my mental clarity throughout the day. All of those come in some really great flavors, and my favorites are the Blueberry and the Citrus. They've come out with a brand new flavor. It's called Tropical Bliss. And I really like it. It's got this pineapple, like, coconut citrus flavor to it. It's really nice, man. And 101CBD wants to invite you to come into any of their retail stores and try it out. They have one in Omaha, Nebraska, one in Denver, Colorado, one in Ojai, California, and now they have two stores in Ventura, California. They just opened up a new one at 1121 South Seward Avenue. That is right on the beach. Really nice location. So if you can, come on in and try that new flavor, the Tropical Bliss. In the meantime, if you can't make it into the stores, go over to 101cbd.org, order yourself some full-spectrum raw CBD oil, and don't forget to use coupon code IMGS25 so you can get 25% off of that order. All right, now let's start the show. Brothers and sisters, welcome back. This is the In My Grow Show, the podcast dedicated to taking the mystery out of cannabis. I'm your host, Alex. And I want to thank you for taking the time to hang out and listen to me. I truly do appreciate that. Now, later on, I'm going to play a conversation that I had with Andrew D'Angelo from The Last Prisoner Project. And I wanted to make sure to play that whole conversation for you. But at the same time, I didn't want the show to run too long. So this week, there is no Cannabis Garden 101. But we will continue that series next week. I believe we're talking about um, male, female, sex, and a soil next time. But that's next week. Right now, I want to take a moment and say happy Father's Day to all of my fellow dads out there. You were amazing at like the height of the quarantine when everybody was going mad and going nuts. You kept everybody calm at your house, you know. You kept everything in perspective. Don't worry about it. We're going to be okay. You fucking killed it, you guys. Good job. So, you know, take the day and do something fun for yourself, man. Go fishing. Go go ride a dirt bike. Go play some disc golf. Go play some regular golf. You know, sit in front of the TV and watch Blade Runner four times in a row. Whatever it takes for you to relax, man. Go ahead and do that today. You deserve it. And while we're on the subject, I want to say happy Father's Day to my pops. You know, I, you know, I appreciate everything you did for me when I was a kid when I was growing up, man. I, uh, I truly do appreciate it, and I love you very much, pops. And now, so I hope everyone's gardens are looking great, whether it's your cannabis garden or your vegetable and victory garden, whatever you got going on, man. I hope it's running great. Let's see, my tomatoes are coming up pretty good. I got some early girls going. They're still green, but, you know, they're showing a little bit of color. And my jalapenos are already coming up. Those are ready. And so are the sweet peas. And my mystery girl cannabis plant that's flowering, I, I scoped her yesterday. I think I'm going to give her like another week before I chop her down. I think I said that same thing last week. But, you know, the trichomes are still all milky. You know, I've got maybe 5-10% amber trichomes. I like to chop them down when the trichome heads are about 30% amber. So I figure about another week she should be okay. She should be ready. The other thing I wanted to talk about was that um, I saw this show on Netflix. And it's called Cooked with Cannabis. And it's a cooking competition show, but with the centerpiece being cannabis. And what I really liked about it was that it was helping normalize a conversation by putting cannabis in this positive spotlight, you know, showing how professionals, like professional chefs, can use cannabis as as an accent to a meal. You know, it was really cool to see. The only criticism I had about the show was that they used the word fuck a lot. And, you know, not not so much that they used the word fuck, but that they seemed to use it or leave it in like gratuitously, like to be extra edgy. Hey, we're not only talking about cannabis, but we're we're cussing as well. I don't know. It was just a trip. It just seemed like uh, um, everybody had to get at least seven fucks in. And I'll rate the show about a six, maybe a seven. It was an all right show. Uh, check it out, man. Let me know what you think. Yeah, it's on Netflix. It's called, what did I say? It's called uh, Cooked with Cannabis. That's another thing I was wondering is why they didn't have baked anywhere in the title. Is it because baked would be too obvious? You know, baked with cannabis? But then it'd be like a baking show, I guess. Or it would give the 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 idea that it's a baking show. I don't know, man. Like I said, check it out. Let me know what you think. All right. Now let's get to the strain of the week. 
And today, I'm going to talk about the Nepalese. Um, if you heard last week's show, that little intro of, of me just stammering and staggering was because of this Nepalese. Now, this flower is a pure sativa strain and is natively grown in the Nepal region of the world, hence the name. And this flower had this like citrusy, lavender, wet dirt, pine coney smell and taste to it. And it was a very, very heavy hitter. I mean, this flower left me chatty and a bit dumbstruck at times. I'm not kidding. When I first got it, I rolled the joint. Took like four nice good drags from it. And like suddenly I forgot my name and my address for like 10 minutes. Now, coming down wasn't too bad. It was kind of smooth. Not so much of a roller coaster, you know. But a couple of times when I got really, really high, it did give me couch lock. And uh, yeah, it sent me to bed kind of early those nights. So just be aware of what you're getting into with this Nepalese. And you know what? I'm also really glad I got some because I'm growing a Nepalese diesel cross, which sounds like it's going to be amazing. But that's uh, another conversation for another time. At any rate, man, um, if you see the Nepalese or the Nepal, get it, pick it up. Let me know what you think about it. And that, my friends, is the strain of the week. Now let's get into the report from the Cannabis Frontline. Okay, um, now this first article comes from the Growth Op, and it was put together by Angela Stelmakowick. Oh man, Angela, I hope I pronounced that right. But the title of the article is, Police thought they made a big weed bust, but a judge ordered them to return 1,800 pounds of cannabis oil and $620,000 in cash. And this is a follow-up to a story I read back in January about one of the local cannabis cultivation farms getting raided. And it starts off, a judge in California has ordered the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Office to return 1,800 pounds of cannabis oil and $620,000 in cash that it seized earlier this year from a cannabis farm. The raid of a Royal Vedder Farms this past January resulted in the seizure of the cannabis oil and cash with the Sheriff's Office later arguing before the court that because the assets related to an ongoing criminal investigation, they should be forfeited to the office. The sheriff's office argument did not fly with the judge, however. The records here show that the California licensed cannabis operator committed no crime, much less intentionally committed a crime. So let me see if I understand this. The cops wanted to keep 1,800 pounds of cannabis oil and $620,000 because... It was evidence in an ongoing investigation, not even that the investigation had been concluded, but even but just because it was ongoing, they feel like they should be able to keep that. Well, good on the judge for upholding the law and noticing that, uh, yeah, no crime was committed, man. Goes on to say the cannabis oil, which represents about two thirds of the company's saleable inventory, had already been sold to Procan Labs and was being stored by Arroyo Verde Farms. Unless the seized cannabis oil is returned to Procan expeditiously, the company will likely be forced to close its business, the judge in the case said. Citing the ruling, Procan Labs reported that criminal laws such as the state's Controlled Substance Acts do not apply to licensed commercial cannabis activity. The court further found there was no black market oil whatsoever on the premises, and all substances had been clearly tagged. Goes on to say police confiscated the cannabis oil and money from cannabis operator Barry Brand. Even though Brand claims he was operating largely within local and state regulations, the district attorney pointed to technical non-compliance issues giving rise to allegations of criminal conduct. So again, the way I understand this is they raided this farm because of technical non-compliance issues? Wow. Talk about heavy-handed. Well, either way... um. I'm glad it all resolved itself. I'm glad, you know, hopefully uh, all the charges are dropped against Barry Brands. All right, the next article comes from MaryJane.com. And it's titled, UK Cops Use Heat Tracking Drones to Uncover Massive Illegal Weed Grow. This is put together by Zach Harris. It starts off, earlier this month, a thermal imaging camera attached to a government drone uncovered an illicit cannabis grow with 667 plants hidden in a former pub in a small English town. According to Birmingham Live, the heat-sensing drone was able to pick up on the black market cultivation site thanks to the unusual temperature of the building's grow lights. Once inside, cops dismantled the grow operation and destroyed the plants, which cops later valued at approximately 500,000 pounds. 
that's 500,000 pounds, um, like the currency, like the English currency, not 500,000 pounds of weed. Goes on to say, but despite the military-grade surveillance tech and warrantless sky-high searches, local cops did not locate any people associated with the black market grow house and did not make any arrests. Is it just me or does that sound suspicious? You think those guys were tipped off? Like they know somebody on the task force? They said, hey, we, uh, we need to make a bust. Or they're coming to get you? I don't know, sounds kind of uh, fishy. The cannabis bust comes amidst global protest against police brutality and overspending, including massive marches in London and Birmingham. And if you need an example of just how defunding the police could help underserved communities, just think about how much money we spent to buy, maintain, and operate the heat, tack the heat tracking drones cruising around rural England. Across the world, drone companies have played both sides of the policing fence, with some autonomous flyers used with some autonomous flyers used to deliver weed in legal states like Washington, while other high-tech companies have sold their heat-tracking cameras as a way to weed out MDMA users at festivals. Yeah, so it turns out that the cops in England used, these, used this heat-seeking drone to find a grow house, which just means that um, illegal grow operations are going to have to up their game somehow. I don't know, start running refrigeration lines inside a grow house? Yeah, how would you do that? How would you mask a whole, like, heat signature of a building? I don't know. They'll figure it out. And that last bit about um, using this heat-seeking technology for MDMA users at festivals. So I checked the internet, and apparently there's this one festival in England that wants to use or did use heat-seeking technology to identify people using MDMA at festivals or at their festival. Which MDMA is just, what is it? It's, it's ecstasy. It's molly, I believe. And the reason they're using it is because MDMA pushes up your body temperature. It gives you hyperthermia, which means a high body temperature. And the article said that they want to use it in order to help save people from themselves. To make sure people don't, you know, like dehydrate in the sun and die. Because this one young kid, because that happened to this one young kid in England last season. But my question is this. Is it illegal to be on drugs? In public? In England? Probably. I mean, can you get arrested, like, at a festival for being on drugs? Wouldn't they have to, like, arrest most people there on some kind of drug? At the very least, they're on alcohol. Uh, but they're not talking about that kind of drug, huh? They're talking about uh, what they consider, I don't know, illegal drugs? Drugs that they uh, can't tax? I don't know. Anyways, um, yeah, it's a trip, man. Heat-seeking technology. All right, and the last article comes from normal, that is normal.org. Go over there, get educated, and then become a member. And it starts off, Pennsylvania Supreme Court rules that medical cannabis use is permissible while on probation. Justice for the Supreme Court of the state of Pennsylvania have struck down a countywide policy that barred those on probation from accessing medical cannabis. It was a countywide. Did I say countrywide? It's countywide. I don't know. The ruling determined that the local Lebanon County ban was in conflict with the state's medical marijuana access law, which states that Pennsylvanians registered with the program shall not be punished for their use of cannabis. Writing, writing for the court, Chief Justice Thomas G. Saylor opined, opined, does that mean his opinion? Opined? Opined the MMA, the Medical Marijuana Act, contains an immunity provision protecting patients from government sanctions. Per the statute, no such individual shall be subject to arrest, prosecution, or penalty in any manner or denied any right or privilege solely for lawful use of medical marijuana or for any other action taken in accordance with this act. Although ensuring a strict adherence to the MMA by those possessing a valid medical marijuana card may be difficult, Justice further rejected the argument that those on probation may be prohibited from accessing medical cannabis because the substance is categorized as a Schedule I controlled substance under Federal Controlled Substance Act. He said the Federal Controlled Substance Act does not and could not require states to enforce it. In enacting the MMA, the Pennsylvania legislature proceeded pursuant to its independent powers to define state criminal law and promote the health and welfare of its citizenry. 
While the circumstances are certainly uneasy, since possession and use of medical marijuana remains a federal crime, we find that the district cannot require state-level adherence to the federal prohibition. Where the General Assembly has specifically undertaken to legalize the use of medical marijuana for enumerating, for enumerated therapeutic purposes. That is awesome. Good on you, Judge Thomas G. Saylor, for, you know, upholding the spirit of that law, man. And, you know, not letting people use the federal government as some kind of bully. Because, yeah, it seems kind of weird, right? Um, you can have access to medicine unless you're on probation. Why is it that cannabis gets to be treated so special? You know, I don't see them trying to do this for, for antidepressants. You know, if, if, if you're on probation, you can't have your antidepressants. Makes no fucking sense. Good on you, Judge. And that, brothers and sisters, is the report from the Cannabis Frontline. As always, there are links in the show notes so you can read all of these stories at your leisure. Now, I'm going to play a conversation that I had with Andrew D'Angelo from The Last Prisoner Project. And we had an awesome conversation, not just talking about The Last Prisoner Project, but about, you know, social equity and cannabis, uh, you know, gun ownership, and the hypocrisy of the cannabis laws in this country. It was a great conversation, man. I love talking to that guy. Um, hang tight. I'm going to play a little bit of music, and then I'm going to put that conversation on for you. Well, brothers and sisters, check it out. With me today, I'm real excited to have on the show Andrew D'Angelo from The Last Prisoner Project. Andrew, brother, welcome to the show, man. I really appreciate you taking the time. Great to be with you today, Alex. So before we get into the conversation, Andrew, do me a favor. Can you introduce yourself a little better than what I just did? Sure, I'll be happy to. I'm Andrew D'Angelo. Uh, many of you may be more familiar with my older brother, Steve D'Angelo. Uh, Steve and I have been doing cannabis business and activism since we were teenagers, and we're best known for Harborside. Harborside is a chain of dispensaries in California. We started in 2006 as a medical cannabis company, and now we're a fully integrated uh, adult and medical cannabis company in California. We have a farm, and we have a manufacturing brand, and we have uh, four uh, retail dispensaries. Uh, last Prisoner Project is a nonprofit that we started last year. And our, our mission is very simple to free all uh, cannabis prisoners on earth and to reintegrate them into society. Uh, and we've been doing that work for about a year now. And um, I'm happy to report we're starting to grow and build some momentum and add more people to our team. And uh, we're starting to become a, a real organization. It's exciting. That is exciting. That's really that's really great work you guys are doing over there, um, both at Harborside and at the Last Prisoner Project. Now, but let me ask you something, Andrew. So what was the catalyst, man? What was that thing that brought you to this project, you know, to want to address this, this issue? Because a lot of people, you know, really don't want to lend themselves to this kind of thing. What got me into this? Is that what you're asking? Alex? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, okay. The, 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 you know, as I mentioned, my brother Steve and I have been doing this a long time. And, and when you've been trading in cannabis as long as we have, most likely you've had some encounters with law enforcement. And Steve had his first encounter with law enforcement when he was 18 years old. And I was only nine years old. My brother's about nine or 10 years older than me. And um, I had to visit him in prison. Um, and uh, that was a, a kind of a traumatic experience for a nine-year-old um, to go through and our whole family to go through. And so n not knowing at the time that that was my first encounter with social justice issue uh, with respect to cannabis prohibition, um, you know, and then as I grew up and began to get close to cannabis myself and trade in cannabis myself. You know, a lot of our friends and people we worked with got busted. Um, and, and, uh, we had to bail them out of prison. We had to get them lawyers. We had to visit them in prison we had to deal with, um, the side effects of imprisonment on families and children and 
that sort of thing. So we became acutely aware of the effects of cannabis prohibition on the community we were in. And um, that's what motivated us to change the law so so we could stop that um, from happening uh, to people getting arrested for cannabis. And, and so we did that work. It took a long time, but at least here in California, uh, cannabis is, is legal uh, for adults uh, and for medical patients. So um, now we can focus on, uh, um, you know, helping um, on this mission to to get people out of uh, out of prison and sort of continuing that work we did in our community for many decades. And even at Harborside, we had programs where patients could write letters to prisoners, cannabis prisoners in exchange for free medicine at Harborside. And we've always tried to keep uh, awareness and consciousness that we have brothers and sisters behind bars. Uh, many of them uh, are, are, are poor people, immigrants, people of color, and, um, and people who have been carrying the cannabis plant of all uh, colors and, and, and creeds um, for decades. Um, so, so that's what Last Prisoner Project just kind of continues uh, that work. And, and, you know, we're blessed because, you know, the, the, the community, the cannabis community is really responding to Last Prisoner Project. And I think social justice overall, um, I'm, I'm proud to say the cannabis industry seems to be uh, quite active. Hey, so on that on that same kind of vein, let me ask you this, man. So with cannabis being more popular, you know, a lot more states are, are opening up these markets. I mean, what kind of responsibility do you think like these legal companies or the, these cannabis companies and these markets have to these individuals still in prison? Because look, I mean, a lot of our really favorite, at least my favorite strains, you know, the AK-47, uh, an OG, you know, Granddaddy Purple, those were all put together by people who were considered criminals. You know, and now this cannabis industry is moving forward. You know, there's all kinds of money and investment, but it seems like, you know, they've forgotten on whose shoulders this industry is built on. I mean, I think there's some kind of responsibility that these companies have. Oh, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. In fact, you you basically um, described the origin story of Last Prisoner Project. Um, part of the reason we started it when we did was because we saw the industry blowing up. We saw all these companies going public in Canada, including Harborside. Um, and, um, you know, lots of wealth was being created and, and, you know, th those markets have since collapsed, but, um, and so a lot of wealth has been lost. Um, um, but, um, a lot of economic activity has been generated, um, basically doing the same thing. Everybody's locked up for, on a much bigger scale, you know, uh, we have Michael Thompson. Michael Thompson is a, is a man in federal prison. He's been in prison 26 years. He's 62 years old. He got busted for three pounds of weed. Um, we've got a petition for him to get clemency with Governor Whitmer in, in Michigan. Um, uh, people can go to our website, lastprisonerproject.org, and, and sign that petition. Um, and so three pounds of weed and he's been in jail for 26 years and, you know, Harborside sells three pounds of weed in a couple hours during a typical, you know, retail day uh, in our businesses. So so what you say about the disparity between what the industry's doing and what what these folks behind bars have done is 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 shameful. I mean, we feel <laughs> we felt bad enough about it to 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 start an organization um and it's not just a guilt trip man it's obligation um, um we like you said we're all standing on the shoulders of people who came before us and, and 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 it goes back a long time remember prohibition is 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 a hundred years old um or more uh, in the united states in most states federally it's a little less than that but still been around a long time always used as a tool of enforcement uh against um people of color and immigrants and poor people and people have used the plant it's always been a, about the people who use the plant and have the plant in their lives 
um, and it's been used to attack those those folks, and and it still is to this day. So so it's it's just a basic moral obligation uh, that companies should feel to and to donate to LPP and others. There's all kinds of other social justice groups that that people can get involved in um, that um, uh, are run by by lots of different wonderful people um, and, and and that folks can plug into. But the important thing is to ha- not who you donate to, but but to feel the obligation to donate because if it wasn't for all of us who carried this plant and got busted for it and you wouldn't be in business in in the first place so um i couldn't agree with you more and i hope that everybody listening to the program will will activate that message in your communities and 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 the 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 circles you travel in because it's it's very important Um, um we have to make sure that we hold each other to account to fulfill that sacred obligation. Yeah, and it seems like a really fine point was put on that, at least for me anyways, when the quarantine hit and you had all these states who had like a legal framework for cannabis, whether it's recreational or medical, just all of a sudden say that it's essential, which is fine. I'm not arguing that point, but you still got people in your prisons for that essential work, basically. You know, I mean, how would it's it's just just the hypocrisy was way too obvious, man. It was just yeah, it was like a slap in the face the way it wound up. Oh my goodness, it's 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 more than a slap in the face. It's just one more result of something that's very very broken in this country, and you know. The obligation we've just spoken about the cannabis industry to do as much as we can is 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 just, you know, reflective of 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 what needs to be done on a much larger scale throughout the whole country and every community, <laughs> you know, all the way through. Um, so, so, but you know, I'm I'm pleased to report to you that more and more cannabis companies are stepping up and donating and 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 not just small donations you know we we received our largest donations in the last week um with 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 all the awareness and and um and anger uh out there right now it's activated a lot of people um so i'm very pleased to report that and so this message that we're sending out right now is being heard um, uh, by by the big companies and and um, and and I hope to see a lot more. Hey, Andrew, so I had a question, man, and I don't know. I just want your opinion. I don't know if you really have any information about it, but when it comes to like charges for cannabis, it seems I mean, and obviously, right, that. Sometimes it goes hand in hand when people get busted illegally with cannabis. They've also got weapons with them, whether they have licensed weapons with them or not. But federally or even in states, that just seems to complicate the issue or at least stack the charges against people. Because even if it's a registered gun, you still may pull a weapons charge because of that illegal cannabis you may have. I mean, how hard is that to kind of get around? Terrible. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. If, if the, the weapons add a lot of our constituents that are doing long, long sentences like Michael Thompson, the man I just referred to, um, uh, I think he had one or two, he might not have had any firearms. I think I might be confusing him with another one of our constituents who, who had, um, a couple antique firearms um in his home and he got busted out in the field and then they searched his house and they found the antique firearms which he didn't even shoot you know he didn't even use um they were just antiques um and he got hit with um uh um uh uh, weapons charges and his name's michael pelletier um pelletier and um and he's in a wheelchair actually from a an accident he had when he was a, a kid so it, it, the guns, um, whether they're used, you know, and then, and then of course there's people who, who, who actually used guns in the commission of cannabis crimes. Those cases are a lot more complicated, um, for us obviously to deal with. Um, uh, but just the weapons charges, because, you know, when you're in the cannabis economy and you're in the trade, 
you know, you're preyed on by criminals. Uh, yeah, violence, thieves. violence is a possibility. Um, I mean, that's, you know, we, and, we can and, say that. And, and yet, and a lot of times you have to defend yourself um, or, or, or at least have a deterrence. Um, and so you got a weapon in your, in your possession. So it, 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 it really complicates things very, very badly. And it, and it is a complicated issue, right? Because, you, you know, guns are <laughs> destructive things and, you know, we have to, have mindful boundaries when it comes to them and laws um but uh but you're right there's a lot of times very good people um who have never done any violent act but merely possessed a gun uh and some cannabis and they're in a lot more trouble because of that gun uh, and it's 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 a given circumstance of so many of these cases i'm afraid to say because I remember when California first started their medical program, you couldn't be a medical patient and be a licensed gun owner. You had to be either or. You you couldn't. I still can't. You know, right. So you have to. You either suffer and keep your guns legally, or you know you're breaking the law in either in either direction. Which I mean, you know, makes no sense on any kind of rational thought. No, not at all. I mean, particularly when. Um you look at the other types of crimes that um, people that with convictions have that are allowed to use firearms (laughs) and you're like, Whoa, hold on a second here. Um, And and in the case of medical patients, people who have not even committed a crime um, uh, simply using medicine, they're not allowed to, to legally own firearms. That's a federal rule by the ATF. We fought it bitterly and lost, of course. Um, uh, but that's another reform that needs to change. Um, thankfully, one of the things that happens when you become close to the cannabis plant is is y- y- you tend to want to have guns and shoot guns off a little bit less, perhaps, than, than folks that may not have cannabis in their lives. So uh, I do think that uh, the plant provides a little bit of a, a check and balance on, on the firearm, too. Um, uh, certainly a license would. Yeah, it does. But I, I got to be honest with you, man. Um, sometimes guns are fun, man. Take it out to the range and, uh, <laughs> you know, just let off a couple. That's fine, man. It's a lot of fun. I, I, I get it. I get it, you know. But, um, yeah. yeah, I just think it's it's this real just odd odd space that cannabis has put in because they just want to, you know, keep it it's as It's stigma, limited. man. It's all stigma. <laughs> It all comes down to stigma. We have so much stigma we're dealing with, you know. Uh, it has a huge impact on our communities, and that's just one of them, the, the firearm issue for medical patients. But there's so many. I mean, uh, I remember, you know, before we had cannabis legalized and you were in the cannabis trade, you know, you'd be in the circles of mainstream society and people would you'd introduce yourself and you'd and you know inevitably the second question after what's your name is what do you do for a living (laughs) yeah what do you do exactly what do you do for a living and all of a sudden you're confronted with this question that is very hard to answer um and just the stigma and shame associated with that i remember being acutely aware of um at the time and and that stigma is it's the reason people don't want a cannabis dispensary in their neighborhood. It's a reason we have so many problems with the legalization framework in California. And most communities don't have legal access to cannabis here. It's all stigma. It's all these false perceptions that somehow some terrible thing will befall a community if there's a cannabis dispensary in it. Um, and it's just not the case. <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah, that's that's here in California. What gets me is like places like in Florida where they don't even they have a medical program, but they don't even allow flour. It's like they don't even want to see people smoking joints or anything. I was like, wait, how can you? Well, have, you I know, know right? Isn't that uh, that was again another battle we lost um, in Florida. The activists lost, um, and you know, Minnesota, same thing. Medical program without flour. So it's and that again, just I mean, on another level, that just seems like a giveaway to big business, because now you're not allowed to grow your own medicine or your own recreation. You have to get it from someone. You have to have a third party. There's got to be a middleman. 
you know, I, I, I sometimes what we have to fight for in circumstances like that is home grow so people can at least grow their own. Um, uh, but yeah, it, it, it's, the, it, it's, it's really absurd, right? Because it, it, the, 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 the easiest way to give people access to cannabis is, is flour. Uh, flour is the easiest to grow. It's the cheapest to grow. It's the most accessible. It's what people are most used to. Um, it's the lowest barrier of entry, really. Um, it's not as potent as eating cannabis. So, uh, and, and so to discourage that or not allow that is, is the height of absurdity. Uh, it's hard to, for us, people like us, it's hard to fathom that such a thing could such an absurd thing could come to pass <laughs> as a law or a rule. Um, but this is how terrified people are of cannabis. And, 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 you know, the people passing these absurd rules and laws are generally Democrats. They're not Republicans. They're generally Democrats who supposedly are progressive, supposedly are liberal. <laughs> um, and yet it's, it, it, this is what happens. So, so, you know, we have to always do our political work and get a little bit better at, you know, now that we've won the war of legalization in many places, we still have to win that war in many more places. But uh, now the time is we have to start winning all the battles to get the framework and the taxes and the access right um, and to create balance in the supply chain. So, as you say, you know, small businesses, medium sized businesses, big businesses can all be together um, serving the community with all kinds of different cannabis products so that's the promise that cannabis holds that we all see that we all understand in our hearts and our spirits and somehow we just got to be smart enough to make it happen you know hey so can can you talk a little bit about like the actual importance of educating the community because it's one thing for you and i to talk to the industry but it's another thing to get the attention of those people not so much who have already made up their minds to say it's evil but those people who just aren't sure yet you know, because that outreach is uh, really yeah. what's hard, you know, because I, at least from what I've seen, you know, people are interested. But as soon as you invite them, hey, you know, we're going to have this thing. We're going to, you know, talk about it. They're like, oh, wait, I don't want to be seen. So like, well, you know, I mean, you got to get involved. Yeah, I mean, the message that I've been trying to talk about this year to the community. So the cannabis community is a big community, a lot of different stakeholders in it. Um, but for the first time in a long time, we actually have a legal industry, no matter how imperfect it is, it's there in California. It's about a $3 billion a year industry. Um, and, 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 and that gives us a lot of political power that we're frankly wasting away. Um, and it gives our consumers political power. It gives our businesses political power. And it gives all of us political power. And we're just not using it we, One for lots of different reasons. Um, one, you know, our community is pretty skeptical of politics in general. And, and, and I think we prefer to turn away from political so solutions and, and embrace different, more autonomous and um, self-sufficient solutions. Well, you know, you, you know what it also is, though, is that um, a lot of us aren't used to the attention. You know, it seems like a lot of us, because we're used to coming from a very, you know, we're keeping our stuff very hidden. What we're doing is highly illegal, or at least it was. So we're not used to coming out and saying, hey, you know, here I am. Here's what we're yeah. doing. You know? Yeah, that's part of it too, right? Um, 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 there's stigma within us, even though we're cannabis people, because we had to live under this. It's, it's, it's kind of like um, other forms of the other or separation or even hatred where, where there's all this stigma involved in it um, because it's built on this lie. You know, it just takes all these different forms and cannabis prohibition is one of them. Um, uh, but, you know, if we wanted to here in California or, or just about anywhere, if we really, really wanted to, we could create our own cannabis laws, frameworks and tax rates. Um, and if we were active enough and organized enough and coordinated enough and united enough, 
um, we we could do all of those things um, and 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 be very smart about it and 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 not be at the mercy of 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 trying to get you know one of the two political parties to to not be afraid of us <laughs> they're so afraid of us um uh and and so it's hard um whereas if we just leveraged our own power and we created our own majorities and and used kind of the pay to play political system that exists and win within it uh then you know i think we'd all have a lot less to complain about uh so um that's you know we're still learning how to wield all of this because we had to spend so such a long time ending prohibition that how to become effective political operatives now um and is is our next thing we have to learn how to do and and, and uh, you know none of us are super good at it yet um i'm i'm um, you know, uh, yeah, and that's, and, and, that, um, and that but, really shows. But we that... have the power. I mean, we have tremendous power. If we're we're just so fragmented right now, and and, and it's just hard for all, us to agree on a strategy, um, and then fund it. Um, but if we could do those things, if if we could do those things, we could win. It it is possible. I've been in the guts of the political process in California for the last two years as a board member of CCIA. I worked really, really hard on it. I really leaned into trying to fix Prop 64, um, and we failed. We failed for two years. None of the bills passed. None of the politicians helped us. Everybody ran away at the first opposition. Even the industry was divided. Even the industry hired lobbyists and to go against you know, pro-cannabis bills because they didn't want to lose a little bit of market share to competitors um, that they already had somehow. Um, that's what happened to the hemp bill last year. So, um, so was it part of? Uh, so you know, so we it... have to get our political house in order. And to the extent that listeners can 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 do that, um, y- you know that that's what we need to do. Yeah, and the first step, everybody, on that uh, idea: register to vote, please, and then yeah. follow through and vote. Mm-hmm. You know, um, because yeah. uh, being registered to vote is great. But it feels even better when you actually vote for what you and, want. And, you know, there's so many ways to plug in. If you don't like writing letters to politicians, you can write letters to prisoners. If you don't want to do that, you can make a donation. Um, if you don't want your name on the donation, you can make an anonymous donation. If you if you want somebody else to make the donation, you can talk to somebody else about making a donation. There's just so many different ways to plug in um, that are simple, that are easy, that are fast. You can do on your phone um, when you're riding the bus. And then all of a sudden you participate in a activism event that that that's how power happens. Um, uh, the, the power of the powerless <laughs> comes from uh, um, everybody being active. It comes from overwhelming the system, as we've seen in the last week or 10 days out in the streets, just overwhelming, just overwhelming show of force. Um, and if our community did that with political engagement and voting is certainly the first um, part of that, uh, then we would win. We would win. We would overwhelm the system with majority and, and, and we would win. Uh, so I, I, it, that's a message of hope. Um, uh, and, and, you know, there's nothing more frustrating than pol- politics. The last two years that I was doing that work in Sacramento, incredibly frustrating experience. There were times where I just wanted to tear all my hair out and scream at people. Um, uh, I didn't do that. I kept my equilibrium and, and tried to be good collaborator um, because democracy depends on people showing up and, and getting into the sausage factory, you know, of of decision making in a, in a democratic society. Because if we don't do that, if we don't show up and do that, somebody uh, else will. You know, autocrats will. Yes, somebody <laughs> else will, and they'll be like, "Look, they yeah. didn't show up." So uh, dictators uh, will. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hey, Andrew, brother. So then, let me ask you, man. You like you said, you've traveled around. You've seen you know, the politics in a lot of different ways. I mean, for those communities thinking about implementing or starting some kind of either a medical or a recreational cannabis market, I mean, what are some of the social programs 
they need to start to think about it, or at least take into consideration, in your opinion. Well, you have to have social equity as, 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 as the foundation and building block of your program. Um, so that has to be a foundation of the program. And just, you know, what, what a lot of communities, when they think about embracing legal cannabis, uh, don't fail to understand is you have uh, cannabis is already in your community. It's being done by the legacy market. I call it the legacy market. Um, and they're all over your community. And the legacy market creates access and price stability for cannabis. Uh, that's uh, a challenge for the legal industry to compete with. Uh, and so local communities have to help us do that. And it's not about defeating the legacy market. It's about absorbing the le legacy market and saying, hey, guys, time to come into the legal market. You're going to be just as good or better here. Um, and you'll actually feel a lot better about yourself in the legal market because you can be loud and proud of what you do. You don't have to hide from the world. Um, and, and, and you can develop yourself as a leader, as an entrepreneur, as a business person, even just as a bud tender, if that's what you want to do uh, with your life. Maybe you're a musician. Maybe you're an artist. You, you, you need a good day job that, that makes you feel good. Um, you know, and, and, and there's a path there for uh for people in your community so so that's what leads to uh communities overtaxing cannabis and then places like harborside or even equity businesses that start up can't compete you know with the legacy market in that community and that defeats the whole purpose <laughs> um you know uh, you know andrew uh you're the first person to say that as far as absorbing the legacy or the black market. Everybody else that I've spoken to about it has been on that other tact of defeating it. That's a very no, good point man. that you make, though, man. Because it no, is about because... it is about bringing those that legacy market into the legalized market to have a stronger market for everybody. And, yeah, are, are, are and you it's, kidding me? It's it's, it, it's a it's the basic obligation, like it is for big cannabis companies to help get people out of prison for cannabis. It's a basic obligation to 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 absorb the legacy market. And the fact is, the um, industry needs that. Uh, the industry doesn't know that it needs that because there's this there's a lot of new players in the industry and there's a lot of greed happening right now. It's it's a green rush and there's this mad and people want to you know, get their little uh, piece of the pie in the territory. And, 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 you know, that's capitalism. And, and that, that's how, you know, this, this, that's how goods and services spread quickly and, 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 and make things cheap for consumers. So, um, um, but it gets, again, it gets out of control. It gets out of balance. And then people start to um, create framework, uh, barriers to entry so that um legacy people can't get in and and legacy people are not going to stop working with the plant <laughs> no um, and to, to, and you know you those know, to, to, to think so is naive why would they and so we have to make it we got to make it attractive for them because we like you were saying it, that, it, that, it, yeah i mean that, you that know, other issue I left the legacy market and went into the legal market i made less money you make less money but I didn't. Ha I lived a less stressful life, um, uh, and I didn't have to hide from the world, and I didn't have to, you know, get busted and go through all of that. And um, and and I could, you know, I could live a transparent life. I have nothing to hide right now in the world. You know, you want to watch my phone? Watch my phone. You want to check out all my websites I go to? You want to see all the weed websites I go to? Sure, man. Check them out. I don't care. I'm in the weed business. I'm weed. I'm about weed. It's all weed. <laughs> So it's and, and that freedom of being out uh, in the light um, is 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 something that it, it brings me tremendous joy and value and makes me feel really good because I can be on a program like this and I can talk proudly about my career, and my life and the things I've done and 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 not feel uh, uh, any kind of, of shame uh, for it. And I want all of our people to be able to feel that, too. And, yeah, man, you do have to get used to making a little less money and you know there's certain aspects of that underground lifestyle that legacy lifestyle that are thrilling um and you know you have to sort of find different thrills 
Um, uh, because but running you, a business, a legal business, is plenty thrilling. Believe me. But plenty you got to sleep. You got to sleep better, like you said, man. With, you knowing that the cops aren't going to kick in your door. Oh man, so much better. And and that meant a lot to me. And um, uh, that just meant a lot to me. Now our family took some pretty big hits and some pretty big busts and some friends of mine got busted and some friends of mine got killed. So the, the, it's no joke at a certain point. Right. And, and that's, and, and so you make, you make a little bit of sacrifice to, to on the financial side to, to get in to, to the legal market. And, and, and I, I think by and large, I think most of our people want to do that. Um, does everybody want to do that? No. Um, uh, no, um, not right now. Not at this moment. Uh, there's not enough trust. There's just not enough trust. We, we've been hunted for a hundred years. There's not enough trust, um, to do that yet, um, for everybody. But I, 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 I as a pioneer doing that, I'm hoping that, um, folks can, can see examples, um, like mine and follow behind. It's not without challenges, you know? I mean, my life is a little bit challenging right now, um, uh, just professionally in the industry. But I, I also feel really good about, you know, being where I'm at uh, in, in my career. So, so yeah, we have to absorb. I, I, I really get worried about people who are calling for all this enforcement um, because uh, I think we have to be careful um about that uh i think a, a much better thing for us to do is get the frame fix 64 and 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 accelerate all the things we need to do to 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 open up the market and, and you know ultimately we're gonna have to have interstate commerce because california produces far more cannabis than we can consume and and ultimately the solution to all of this is going to have to involve that or else we're going to have the oregon problem where we have too much weed and not enough places to sell it yeah, and then that causes a whole other host of problems too, man. Um, yes, but, indeed. So, but I, and I want to take you back. I just want to go back a little bit and explain, like barriers of entry. What that means is, are those things that stop people from entering a new industry or any industry? And right now, those barriers of entry into cannabis seem to be the high price of regulation. I'm not saying regulation isn't needed. What I'm saying is, do we does regulation need to be so expensive? Because, again, I think, like we were talking about, that's what stops the legacy market from really being absorbed, from really wanting to come in. Because, like you said, they're going to take a big hit in their profits. Yeah. Um, barriers to entry is just a term that expresses how hard it is to legally comply and get a license to do this from the state and the local people. Uh, it often reflects things like um, cost. Um, so, you know, if you want to sell widgets in a retail store, you're going to pay X amount of rent, whatever the market value, whatever the market rate is. If you want to do the same building but have cannabis retail, you're going to pay three or four times the, the market rate. Um, and you're going to have to pay triple net which means you have to pay the taxes and the insurance that the landlord has to pay. Um, so that's a barrier, right? Because now, because if you have enough money to get in the widget business, all of a sudden you don't have enough money to get in the cannabis business uh, because that just the rent has created a barrier for you. Uh, and that's just one example. So there's many, many examples. Uh, in 2006, when we opened Harborside, we were able to do that for about four hundred thousand dollars now that would that same uh project would probably cost somewhere close to two million dollars uh so and that's just a reflective of the barriers of entry more than anything else wow damn so getting it right is important uh and we we haven't gotten it right yet um, and when we do get it right, the barriers to entry will be more manageable. Uh, the, the challenge is everything's connected. When you build a, an industry, there's an ecosystem that you're building and it's all connected to each other. And if you're only as strong as your weakest part of the ecosystem. So uh, and it's going to be very, very hard for us to, to create the kind of inclusivity um, that we envision uh, until something happens with interstate commerce and the feds um, 
we can do a lot better than we're doing now. But to really solve the thing, um, I think you, 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 you're looking at a situation where the, 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 some, even if it's not the Fed, some kind of interstate compacts, which I think we can do without federal legalization. But Yeah, I mean, tricky. there's. Isn't, I think the States Act is floating around that kind of touches on that. Yeah, it. you know, that's an incremental step. Yes, we have to take it. Mm-hmm. Uh, hey, Andrew, uh, brother, thanks a lot for taking the time and coming on the show, man. I truly do appreciate it. Um, can you let everybody know how to find The Last Prisoner Project and how we can help support it? Yes. Our website is lastprisonerproject.org. Uh, we have a whole tab on there called Get Involved uh, and uh, all different ways that you can get involved. If you're just an individual person, uh, if you're if you're part of a cannabis company and you're a leader in a cannabis company and you want to get involved with your company, um, we have a couple of programs to do that. Uh, and, um, just encourage people to visit our website, follow us on social media, e- even small donations, five, ten dollars uh, really help us. And if you're part of the industry, please sign up for our roll up for freedom program. If you're, uh, on the retail side or a partners for freedom program, if you're a grower manufacturer, uh, and, uh, there's lots of different benefits companies get from being associated with us. And uh, I think uh, you, it, it's um, um, it, it, you'll just feel really good uh, being a part of it. Uh, so that's Last Prisoner Project. And then if anybody out there um, needs advice or strategic advice, uh, you can always reach me at my website, andrewdangelo.com. Hey, and, and real quick, one other thing. So, you know, there's a lot of financial uncertainty out there for individuals. Is is there a way that people can volunteer their time for the Last yep. Prisoner Project? Oh, yeah. Oh, perfect. Oh, yeah. All and right, you good. You can also yeah. write letters to prisoners, which is one of my favorite things to do because it's so rewarding because they will write you back. And n- n- the next thing you know, you're in a relationship with somebody that's pretty intense. <laughs> and um, it's very, very rewarding. Um, because uh, when you're locked up in the joint and you get a letter from somebody, particularly someone you don't know that you're getting to know, it really gives you a lot of um, hope and, and, and focus, um, which is always hard in, in prison. Well, that's great, man. That, that's awesome. Uh, do me a favor, Andrew. Don't hang up. Okay, everybody else, I'm going to play a little bit of music, and then I'm going to be right back. So, yeah, everybody, go over to lastprisonerproject.org and see how you can get involved, see how you can help. Again, I want to thank Mr. Andrew D'Angelo for taking the time to come on the show and talk to us about the Last Prisoner Project. And as always, if you have a question or a comment about this episode, you can send an email to inmygrow at gmail.com. And you can also find us on social media at inmygrowshow. Well, brothers and sisters, that's it. That is the end of the show. I have nothing else to share with you today. As always, if this episode has given you value, educated you, entertained you, or even given you just a little escape from your day, if you can, help the show out with a financial donation. All amounts are welcome. You can go to patreon.com slash inmygrow and leave a donation there. You can go over to inmygrow.com, click on the support the show tab and buy a t-shirt. You can also send a PayPal donation that is inmygrow at gmail.com. And an even easier way to help out is before you go shopping on Amazon, click on the Amazon link in the show notes because that just lets them know that we sent you. The show gets a commission and it doesn't cost you anything. Now, if you can't help the show out financially, don't worry about it. I get it. Here's how you can help. Subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening. Leave a rating and a review. Subscribe to the website inmygrow.com. Then go over to YouTube. Search for the In My Grow Show with Alex. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. And after you do all that, just tell three other people about the show. That's it. Real simple. As I said, mis amigos, my friends, I'm going to go ahead and get on out of here. And you know that I love you all very much. And remember to always grow, learn, and teach. (laughs) 